and only mode. Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin our presentation. I'd like to welcome you to the ISO 9001-2015 Critical Points of Review During the Transition Audit Process webinar. My name is Joseph Krolikowski, and I'm the Technical Director of Perry Johnson Registrars. A couple of technical notes for everyone. Uh, all participants are on mute, uh, but we absolutely want to take your questions, so please utilize the question portion of the dashboard. We will answer those questions at the conclusion of my presentation. Uh, I'll also uh, advise you that copies of today's presentation will be available for download uh, shortly after we're finished. And finally, this webinar and all other past PJR webinars is available for reviewing on our website under previously recorded webinars. Our topics for today, uh, we're going to discuss how the transition will be handled in terms of when you uh, tell us that you're ready and how we would approach that. Uh, we'll discuss the anticipated amount of additional audit time that will be needed. We've got an extensive review of new audit content, uh, a summary of how the audit to 9001-2015 will differ from ISO 9001-2008. Uh, as well as how it will be similar, some concluding remarks, and then your questions. As to how the transition will be handled, um, PJR recognizes that our clients' uh, needs are going to differ and that the timing of the transition is going to uh, be dependent on a number of internal factors. And so, uh, we do want to be as flexible as possible in terms of when the transition takes place. Uh, the ideal approach is to time your transition to your recertification audit. Uh, the recertification audit already includes additional audit time. Obviously, it already comes with the issuance of a new certificate. It is the uh, easiest uh, path to take in terms of the logistics. Uh, however, we do recognize that for some of you, uh, this will not be feasible. Uh, perhaps you went through your recertification audit uh, earlier this year uh, or late last year, uh, and now uh, you are faced with having to transition uh, over a surveillance. Uh, we uh, offer transitioning as part of an annual surveillance. Uh, we are also offering it, if you're on semi-annual surveillances, that we would do it on two consecutive uh, semi-annual surveillance audits. Now, um, in both cases, uh, what will happen is you will receive a revised uh, certificate. And we'll show you how that process will work on the next slide. Uh, also, uh, in both cases, uh, whether it's an annual surveillance or two consecutive semi-annual surveillances, there is going to be uh, a small amount of additional audit time uh, that's going to be necessary. Uh, now, uh, one final word, uh, if you are on a semi-annual uh, surveillance frequency, you absolutely have the option uh, of completing your transition in a single step. You don't have to have it split over two consecutive uh, semi-annual surveillance audits. Let's take a look at how the certificate revision process would work. Let's say that you had an ISO 9001-2008 certificate issued in January of 2016 uh, following a recertification or a Stage 2 audit. Uh, the certificate number uh, would, let's say, is C2016-12345 issue date 115-2016, expiration date September 14th, 2018. Now the reason that that date is the expiration date is that is the mandatory cutoff date. Uh, that was established by the ISO. They have indicated that uh, ISO 9001-2008 will cease to be a viable standard on that date, so any certificates that are issued must bear September 14th, 2018 as the expiration date. So that means that you're going to have to complete your transition 
uh, either in 2017 or in 2018. So let's say for the sake of this discussion that you complete your transition in early 2018. You will receive not a new certificate, but a revised certificate. So your certificate number, you'll note it's the same uh, number, uh, C2016-12345, but now we have a dash R1 associated with it. That stands for revision one. The issue date is the same, January 15, 2016, uh, but the expiration date is now January 14, 2019. So this now bears the full three-year period. In terms of the additional amount of audit time that is going to be needed, uh, we have prepared uh, a special grid uh, for calculation of this additional time. Uh, the full measure of that uh, grid is considered confidential, but we can share uh, a couple of uh, critical details. Uh, for most companies, if you choose to do your transition over a surveillance audit, uh, the amount of additional audit time needed will be four hours. Uh, there are going to be some companies that will be able to transition on a surveillance with no added time or with less than four hours. Uh, we're going to be taking those on a case-by-case -case basis. Again, if you choose to uh, complete your transition as part of a recertification audit, uh, then it would be calculated uh, without this additional four hours. It would be calculated uh, as a recertification audit, just as if you were recertifying to ISO 9001-2008. Uh, now, uh, those of you on the call, uh, if you've got questions about your individual uh, circumstance, uh, definitely reach out to your scheduler, reach out to your sales representative, uh, and they'll be able to provide you with some uh, more specific assistance. Okay, let's begin the process now of looking at the new audit content. Uh, when we first got our hands on the new standard, um, PJR sat down as a management team. We went through this standard. We verified uh, what represented new content, um, tried to get a sense of how this was going to be approached, how much audit time was going to be needed, and so forth. So we're going to share with you now uh, the new audit content. And we begin in Section 4. Uh, section 4 uh, includes a couple of, of really high-level items, high-level ideas. Um, and the first of these uh, asks, has the organization implemented a process to determine, monitor, and review external and internal issues uh, relevant to purpose and strategic direction? Um, now, I, I, first of all, I want to point out that phrase, strategic direction. Uh, kind of bear that one in mind. Uh, we're going to be giving a, a detailed explanation of that term in just a few slides. Um, what's critical on this slide is the whole issue of external and internal issues. There's a couple of things that they were going for with that. Uh, first of all, the phrase issues. Um, it was uh, intended to be um, a blanket term. It was intended to be inclusive uh, and, and capture a lot of different things uh, that an organization could consider. Um, it was intended to capture not just negative events, uh, but also um, influences on the quality system and, and to recognize that um, as an organization there's uh, there's a lot that's going on, there's a lot of moving pieces, and those influences, those pieces are going to come from external sources, uh, folks like customers and suppliers, as well as internal sources, your employees, your departments, and so forth. So uh, this statement, this phraseology uh, is intended to kind of capture all that um, and make it a requirement that you have uh, a process to stay on top of what's going on within and what is influencing, <coughs> excuse me, your organization. Has the organization determined who its interested parties are? Uh, this is the follow-up clause, section 4.2. Uh, 
um, and uh, uh, interested parties is uh, uh, another very uh, important aspect of this and as we've learned in other presentations they mean not just internal uh, interested parties and not just external interested parties but both and of course that's a very inclusive term we've, we've uh, learned about how that includes customers and suppliers and employees and lots of areas um, I'm going to jump ahead one more slide here and just uh, add kind of the second thought on 4.2 and that is have you established a process to monitor and review information about interested parties and identify what their requirements are um, and in a, a little bit here we're going to revisit this whole idea about what are you doing to stay on top of what's going on with uh, interested parties um, I want to address uh, something uh, that came up uh, just recently uh, internally here at Perry Johnson um, um, and that is uh, the notion that uh, if an organization concludes that their customers are their only interested party uh, what um, what should our response be as a certification body um, well, first of all, uh, we're not going to dismiss that idea um, out of hand. We're not going to say, uh-uh, you, you can't make that conclusion. What we are going to say, what we are going to um, uh, challenge you with as our uh, auditee is, okay, how did you come to that decision? Uh, can you show us, can you uh, explain for us the process that you went through to draw that as your conclusion. Um, now additionally, uh, I also want to share that the uh, requirement does not necessarily mean that you have to have a list. Uh, there, there's been a little bit of misconception that uh, it's mandatory to have a list of some sort of who your interested parties are. Uh, we're going to address a little bit later in the presentation um, how uh, um, this should, should be captured, but for now, uh, be assured that it is not mandatory uh, that you have uh, a list. Is the scope statement appropriate and accurate, and does it take into account um, internal and external issues, uh, interested party requirements, what are the products and services? This is uh, from Clause 4.3. Um, this idea was sort of already there. Uh, it just wasn't explicit. Uh, obviously, your scope statement needs to be appropriate. It needs to be reflective of what you do. Uh, if you have a very narrow scope, um, that needs to be uh, kind of carefully considered. If you have a very broad scope, uh, how did that get put together? What we've done is we've put um, a clarifier in our audit report, basically asking the auditors to confirm uh, the adequacy uh, of your scope statement. Simple as that. 4.3 also uh, indicates that uh, exemption uh, can now be sought from any requirement of the standard, not just those for product realization. Um, as before, uh, you're going to be required to have uh, justification for any exemptions that you're taking. Uh, for the most part, uh, the only conceivable exemptions that are going to come up are going to be the ones taken from sections uh, 8 and 7 and primarily section 8 um, you know things like design uh, for companies that don't have measurement devices uh, there's going to be um, uh, section 7.1.5 uh, if an organization does not have a tangible product you know there, there's going to be possibilities there so uh, again, um, if you choose to document your exemptions in the context of a quality manual, that's fine. Um, but of course, quality manuals are no longer mandatory. Moving on to Section 5, a um, couple of really uh, interesting requirements come up here. Uh, all in Section 5.1 and all pretty much geared towards uh, management and the role of management. Um, has management demonstrated that it is accountable for the effectiveness of the quality management system? Um, this, this large question of how do you make yourself accountable 
and um, you know the the idea of course being that uh, the management team um, has to put itself on the line it, it's your system you are the leaders how have you made yourself accountable uh, for the effectiveness of the system so um, we've revised our audit report in a couple of key ways uh, to address this. Um, one, we've, we've kind of added a question that basically asks the auditor, is it evident that management participates? Do you see management participating in the management review process, in responding to customer complaints, in formulating quality objectives? So. Um, I don't think this is terribly different from how it was looked at in the past, uh, but again, we, we've kind of put it out there a little more explicitly and just kind of making sure uh, that management is indeed involved. 511B uh, talks about has the management assured that quality policy and objectives are compatible with strategic direction. Ah, there's that term again. So let's dive into what the standard means by strategic direction. Um, it's interesting because that term comes up in a few places, but it doesn't have an official definition. Uh, so um, it's not in ISO 9000 and it's not officially defined in ISO 9001. So we had to kind of uh, pull in uh, some feedback on this from a few different places, including from the TC-176 committee itself. And the consensus is that strategic direction is um, the organization's vision of where they want to be in the future. It's the long-term view, uh, the long-range view. And the idea is that uh, as an organization, uh, you should have a sense of where you are now, where you want to be in the short term, uh, which would be represented by your quality objectives, your goals, and where you want to be in the long term. Uh, and that's where strategic direction comes uh, into play. And the idea is that your quality policy, your objectives, these things should be positive contributors to your long-term vision. Uh, so uh, in terms of how we have uh, uh, directed our auditors to look at this, we, we've put the question in the workbook and we're trying to get our auditors to ask about it and say, okay, what is the strategic direction? What is the long-term view from management's perspective on where, where the organization is going? 511C, uh, again, we're still in 5.1 here. Has management assured that the quality management system requirements are integrated into business processes? Kind of an interesting new idea here. What do we mean by business processes? And uh, uh, the idea here is that we're looking at some of the administrative activities, accounting, and uh, some of these sorts of areas. Now, in the past, um, those areas were considered hands-off. Um, and for the most part, that's still the case. We're, we're not going to be digging into your ledgers. We're not going to be digging into your uh, financial files and so forth. Um, so in terms of, of verifying that this requirement has been implemented, there's a couple of things that we can point to. Um, number one, um, do you have uh, revision control on the documents that you use within your business processes? Uh, number two, do you have controls in place on the records that you're retaining uh, for uh, retention, retrieval, and so forth? Um, and then number three, are the personnel that participate in those processes, are they competent? Uh, do they have uh, the right skill sets? Have you assured their competency? And so forth. Moving on to section 5.2. Uh, has the organization ensured that the quality policy is available to all relevant interested parties? Um, and again, this is a, a little bit of a, of a, a continuance of a, a how this requirement was viewed before, but uh, it's more explicit now. And, when, and remember, when we're talking about interested parties, we're speaking of both internal and external interested parties. So kind of projecting out your uh, objectives, uh, or excuse me, your quality policy uh, to the larger 
uh, view. And so there's a lot of ways you can do this, of course. Uh, posting it on your website, posting it in your front entry way, uh, and saying, this is how we have uh, projected our quality policy, our, our top level statement on our commitment uh, to an effective quality system. In section 5.3, um, the idea of managing the quality system uh, and the standard says that management needs to take on that responsibility. Um, it's uh, interesting to note, of course, that the standard no longer talks about a management representative. Um, so uh, let's talk about this for, for just a second here. First of all, if an organization decides that they need to have uh, a key person, uh, a focal point for the system, a coordinator for the system, um, that is completely okay. Uh, that is absolutely going to be allowed. What the standard has done with this little bit of uh, revision uh, to the wording is to emphasize that it's important for the leadership team to uh, take the reins, to be the responsible parties in terms of managing the system. Um, you know, because there were a lot of companies out there that had one person and only that one person ran things with the quality system. They took care of all the corrective actions. They took care of everything with management review, all of the reporting, all of the customer surveys. The whole system, so to speak, was on their shoulders. That's not what's intended uh, by a quality management system and by uh, a leadership group or a management team. So they've kind of uh, tweaked the wording a little bit um, to address that. Has top management established a means to monitor if processes are delivering intended outputs? A um, little bit of a tweak on the wording. Uh, again, uh, the existing analysis of KPIs and objectives uh, will fulfill this requirement. Moving on to Section 6. Uh, section 6, of course, is the primary placeholder for the risk requirement, and there's a couple of subclauses that we're going to dig into. Uh, first, in 611, has a process been developed to determine risks? And um, just want to take a second to re-emphasize here that you do not have to have a formal process uh, for risk management. Um, and uh, um, in terms of what is going to be expected, and this will be uh, reiterated a few times during our presentation today, um, uh, the way I've tried to explain this uh, to folks that have asked me about it, remember that you need to understand this requirement. You need to understand what is the approach that we've taken to incorporate risk-based thinking into our existing processes. Um, that's, that's really the larger picture here, is uh, have we incorporated risk-based thinking into our processes? Now when we look at 6.1.2, uh, which is uh, the sister clause, it says, has a process been developed to address the identified risks and to evaluate the effectiveness of those actions that you're taking? Um, the, uh, the, the big picture here is, do you as an organization have an effective set of processes? Um, and part of what it means to be effective is to uh, identify potential risks and take actions accordingly. Um, so, you know, you think about things like uh, a preventive action program or competency or reviewing contracts, uh, all of these things that are uh, risk uh, aversion uh, in nature. Uh, kind of bear that in mind. This is going to come up in one more spot, and I'll be sure to point it out uh, when we get to it. Uh, in terms of how this is going to be audited, um, we have added a question to our audit report, and we've instructed our auditors to kind of open with a very uh, open-ended question. What is the approach that you've taken to ensure uh, that there is risk-based thinking as a component of your processes? 
In 6.2, uh, we have a couple of uh, new requirements pertaining to quality objectives. First, are quality objectives relevant to the conformity of products and do they enhance customer satisfaction? Now, in terms of the assessment of quality objectives, that's unchanged. Uh, we still have a component of our audit report for it. I do want to address, um, though, the manner in which this is worded. Uh, a number of our clients have quality objectives that uh, kind of go outside of product conformity and customer satisfaction. Uh, they might talk about profitability. They might talk about uh, quote win rate. Uh, they might get into uh, some of the other uh, areas of the system, of the company. Um, is it going to be acceptable to continue to have those objectives? Yes, uh, so long as you also have objectives that you can point to that fulfill this criteria. So uh, if profitability, if quote win rate or things of that nature are value added to your company to have as established objectives, please feel free to continue to have those items as long as you have other items that address these ideas. Additionally, with quality objectives, the standard now says that you have to uh, assign resources, identify responsible parties, establish a timeline, and determine evaluation practices. All things that were implied uh, previously, uh, but have now been made more explicit. Moving on to Section 7, we've got a couple of slides here for 7.1.6, which is called Organizational Knowledge. Um, and the standard says that uh, you have to have a process for organizational knowledge. Um, so what, what does that term mean? What is organizational knowledge? Um, you can understand organizational knowledge in general as knowledge that is gained through experience. Um, that means that uh, uh, you know if you've got somebody in your organization that is just critical, and if that person were to step away, you would have a serious deficiency. If you've got one machine that just one person knows how to run and, and run well, uh, say if you have a laser cutting machine, and you've only got one person in your whole company that knows how to run this machine, that could potentially be an organizational knowledge challenge. Um, that's one aspect of this. Uh, additionally, uh, organizational knowledge is understood as uh, learning from past mistakes. And uh, you know, if you had a complaint, a return, and you took action as a result of that, and improved your processes, how does that flow out? How do you retain that so that that lesson learned is not lost with the passage of time? So how do we control knowledge in general? How do we share knowledge with the employees of our organization? Well, there's a number of things that you can do. You can think about work instructions. You can think about cross-training. You can think about the production controls that you have in place. You can think about the quality controls that you have in place. Um, all of these things are uh, available as options. Uh, again, the idea here is when you're asked about it, do you understand the concept and can you explain what approach you've taken? 7.1.6 also uh, indicates that uh, an organization needs to assess uh, existing competencies against changing needs and trends. So in addition to making sure that you don't have uh, one or two key people that if you lose them, your system is brought to its knees, in addition to learning from past mistakes, you also have to be prepared for what's coming you have to be prepared for the challenges that lie ahead. And that's where this other aspect of organizational knowledge comes to bear. And in terms of how we're going to audit this, this will be uh, obviously a component of uh, looking at competency processes uh, and also planning processes. Moving on to Section 8, uh, we have a couple of items that pertain to design. Uh, so these next two slides are for those of you that design your products or participate in design. Uh, first of all, 
do design inputs include standards and or codes of practice uh, that you have committed to implement? And um, there's a lot that can be swept up in this term, standards and codes of practice. Uh, we can think about military standards. We can think about uh, trade group standards, um, things of this nature. In terms of how we will audit this, um, no different than how we already audit design inputs. We would look at uh, things like your projects. We would interview your engineers, try to get a sense of the approach that you've taken uh, with this requirement. Additionally, uh, do your design inputs con uh, include consideration of consequences of failure? Uh, due to the nature of products or services. So again, this was kind of implied in the past. It's now more explicit. Um, is there a hazard associated with your product? You know, what could happen um, to the end user? What could happen? Um, so for those of you that design end user products, this is going to potentially uh, be uh, uh, something that you'll have to be prepared to show. If you design a piece of a much larger assembly, well, this may have limited uh, applicability in your case. Uh, but again, two areas where we project this uh, having some applicability, safety uh, and or financial fallout. Section 8 also has uh, some requirements in it pertaining to external providers. Um, do you have a process uh, for communicating uh, your intentions uh, in the control and monitoring of external provider performance to the external providers? Uh, you're required to monitor external providers, but do they know uh, how you're going about doing that? So obviously we already have a lot of ways uh, for communicating with our supply base, uh, purchase orders, contracts, websites, etc. One of these can be brought to bear to fulfill this requirement. Have controls been established for external provider property uh, where ownership does not transfer uh, to the organization? Uh, kind of an interesting idea here. We've already had uh, customer property as a requirement for a number of years. So now we, we ask, well, okay, what if we happen to have uh, external provider property? So um, in terms of, of what this could mean, an example of this, let's say that it was necessary for you to set up a powder coating uh, process. Um, and there's a lot of investment associated with that. So you make an arrangement with a subcontractor. They say, okay, we'll come in, set up the booth, set up the fans, run all the hosing for you, uh, we'll supply the paint, but officially this powder coating booth belongs to us as your subcontractor. Um, what the standard says is in those circumstances, if you have uh, damage uh, to external provider property, if there's loss of external provider property, uh, you are uh, uh, just as obligated to let them know about it as you would be if it was property belonging to your customer. Uh, obviously, this will have limited applicability in a lot of cases, but uh, the requirement is now part of the standard. Section 855 establishes some requirements for post-delivery activity. Um, there's warranty implications here. There's recycling implications here. Uh, a lot of activities are included. Uh, one of the things uh, that we've been asked is if an organization has uh, no uh, activity of this nature, uh, can the requirement be excluded uh, in its entirety? Um, we do uh, obviously consider the possibility of uh, full exemption uh, in all circumstances, but uh, bear in mind that one of the activities that's discussed here is customer feedback. So um, again, it, 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 full exemption of 855 is completely pr uh, possible and, and can be, uh, if it can be justified, will be accepted. But uh, uh, bear that aspect of it in mind. 
Section 856 talks about responding to changes. We've actually got two slides for this here. Has the organization determined a process for responding to unplanned changes in such a way that conformity with specified requirements is maintained? And then also, have we determined a method for retaining documented information about changes, including who authorized the change and actions arising uh, from the change? So, in terms of, of how we're going to approach this, um, uh, we feel that for a lot of organizations, um, uh, changes can be kind of thought of in, in two realms. We have planned changes and we have unplanned changes. And um, our presumption is that in a lot of cases, unplanned changes are going to uh, very likely be uh, captured as part of a corrective action process, a customer complaint resolution process, and so forth. So in those cases, um, that would serve as your documented information, which leaves us with plan changes. Uh, and again, um, you know, every organization is going to be different in terms of how they approach uh, plan changes. Um, and we're open to what your strategy would be. If that means that it's part of your management review, then that's what it means. If that means that you have a more formal um, APQP type process and so forth, then that's what that means. But again, uh, we are taking a very open-minded view of how that requirement is fulfilled. Moving on then to Section 9. We have a couple of new input requirements for management review, uh, and I've actually got three slides for this, uh, all three with the same general comment on the audit method. Uh, our approach for auditing management review is unchanged. Uh, it's still a line item in our, manage, in our uh, audit report, rather, and is to be assessed at every audit. Uh, so what are the new content items? Well. You have to ensure that you are discussing internal and external issues, uh, including the effect on your strategic direction. There's that word again. And this kind of takes us back to where we began in terms of uh, making sure that your system is robust and that it considers issues. And, and again, taking that whole idea that issues is not necessarily uh, exclusively meant to mean bad things. Has the management review been structured that it includes discussion of external provider or supplier performance? Uh, this was something that was implied in the past. It has now been made more explicit. You should be discussing external provider performance uh, within the context of the management review meeting. And has the management review meeting been structured to include a discussion of risk management actions? And this is actually the one place in the standard where it is explicitly required that discussion of interested parties uh, and risk managements, both of those ideas, be captured and on the record. So uh, assessing those risk management actions. So uh, management review um, has always been a very important piece of the puzzle in fulfilling the requirements of ISO 9001. Uh, I would opine that it is even more important now uh, than it was in previous revisions. Okay, let's shift gears now and discuss uh, the difference in uh, the audit and how the audit is going to feel different. Um, we feel that for the majority of our clients, uh, the difference in the audit is going to be minimal. It's going to be manageable. Um, and the key differences can be put into three general categories. Uh, the expanded role of leadership, the impact of risk-based thinking requirements, and the elimination of previously required documentation. Let's cover each of these in further detail. Leadership is going to be expected to uh, kind of step up and, and be prepared uh, to speak confidently on the performance of the system. 
Uh, I mentioned earlier that we have a question in our audit report now that asks, is it evident that leadership is a participant? Uh, we've also uh, inputted a new section in our audit report that's called leadership interview. And we've instructed our auditors to uh, assemble the leadership team uh, and ask them uh, some of these questions and ascertain uh, as a group do they have a handle on interested parties? Uh, can they speak confidently about what the current internal and external issues are? Um, and so forth. Uh, so that's been written right into the audit report. And that'll, of course, be a little bit different from how it was done before. The review of risk management uh, and risk-based thinking, we have uh, uh, emphasized in past presentations that you don't have to have a formal process. Uh, so again, what we've instructed our auditors to do is ask, uh, quite simply, ask about risk-based thinking. Ask about the concept. What do you have in place for this? How have you incorporated risk-based thinking into your processes? And again, uh, preventive action, competency planning, reviewing requirements, these are all things that can be used uh, to show that this is being done. And then third, uh, no more preconceived expectations for documentation. Um, we uh, feel that for a lot of organizations, um, it's likely that things will go on as they were before in terms of procedures quality manual, and so forth. A lot of our clients have expressed that they have no intention uh, of getting rid of those items. Um, the difference now is that uh, as uh, a registrar, as a group of auditors, we cannot demand that you have a procedure for any particular activity. Um, and uh, we can't uh, even say to you that the procedure isn't detailed enough uh, what, uh, obviously, if you choose to have a procedure, we're going to hold you accountable to what that procedure says. So, for example, if you choose to have a procedure for management review, and it says that you're going to do management review on a quarterly basis, if we come in and it's been almost a year since you've had a management review meeting, we have um, every right uh, to cite that as a nonconformance. Um, so, uh, again, uh, not required, we can't demand them, but we absolutely can still audit them and hold you accountable to them. A couple of uh, other items I want to mention uh, in terms of uh, what's going to likely feel new. Uh, we are uh, at the direction of the accreditation bodies. Uh, we're digging in a little more with statutory and regulatory requirements, and we've actually added a special section uh, to our audit report on these activities. Now, what we've uh, tried to emphasize is uh, we're not uh, auditing compliance to these requirements so much as we are auditing that you have a process uh, for identifying these items, a process for implementing these items. Uh, we are not OSHA auditors. We are not um, uh, auditors of the Clean Water Act and things of this nature. Uh, our job is to make sure that you have an effective process in place for those items. Um, additionally, uh, we've been directed to provide some comment in our audit report on whether or not your system uh, adheres to the spirit of the IAF Expected Outcomes publication. Let's dig into what that is uh, for just a few minutes. IAF Expected Outcomes uh, is a publication of the International Accreditation Forum. It was first drafted back in 2012, and it represents a series of key ideas pertaining to the larger picture of what a quality management system should mean for the organization that implements it. Uh, we've provided the URL here if you would like to go and view this document yourself. The expected outcomes document has nine key ideas, uh, and I've listed them here. Now, if you read through this list from front to back, 
you should recognize that every single one of these items is represented in some way in the content of the ISO 9001 standard. So the larger picture here is that if you've implemented uh, and are maintaining an ISO 9001 compliant quality management system, you are fulfilling these expected outcomes uh, by default. Uh, that's kind of the larger picture here. In terms of how an audit to ISO 9001 2015 is going to feel the same, um, the most important thing for you to remember is that when we audit you, we audit your processes. We audit the named processes of your quality system. Uh, and that is not changing. That is uh, very much the same as it has ever been. We stopped doing element-based audits uh, over 13 years ago. Uh, it, it is absolutely still an audit of your processes. Uh, and we're still using the same auditing methods. We're still observing what you do. We're still interviewing your staff. We're still reviewing your records. Um, none of that has changed. And we still expect you to demonstrate that your processes uh, have fulfilled the requirements of the ISO 9001 standard. In conclusion, uh, we are ready to ensure that your organization has a smooth transition to ISO 9001-2015. We are confident that for the majority of our clients, this transition will proceed with minimal difference from past assessments and that you will feel that the new standard has brought a whole host of benefits to your company. I'd like to invite you to tune in to one of our other webinars. Uh, ISO 9001 2015, Preparing for a Successful Transition, is delivered on a semi-monthly basis. It is an overview of the development of the standard uh, and a review of the layout of the standard. It tries to answer some key questions that have been asked. The interaction of processes and its importance to a successful audit is also shown on a semi-monthly basis. It's an exploration of the critical topic of processes and how to correctly understand them. And then lastly, what to expect during your stage one audit, uh, also sh shown semi-monthly. It's intended to help you prepare for your first official assessment by a certification body. We'd like to keep in touch with you and so invite you to visit our website at www.pjr.com. If you go to the bottom of the page, enter your email address and click subscribe, you'll be opted in uh, for automatic updates on points of interest. I do thank you for your time. At this time I will be unlocking the question portion of the dashboard to see if we have any questions today. Okay, uh, Gary Butler asks, what if proprietary information is in the business plan. Uh, how much of this has to be open for audit? Well, Gary, obviously, um, if it's an item that is pertinent to your quality management system, um, we would potentially need to see uh, some of that. Um, I'll remind you that, of course, we have non-disclosure agreements between our uh, uh, clients and ourselves in all circumstances. Um, and uh, in terms of if there are things in there that need to be withheld from view and so forth, I'm sure that your auditor uh, would be uh, uh, agreeable to, to whatever approach you wanted to take with that. We're getting some questions on availability of the seminar. Again, uh, this seminar will be available for reviewing shortly, and the slides will be available for download shortly as well. Rebecca McKean asks, where can internal auditors receive training? Uh, Rebecca, bear in mind that as an internal auditor, uh, it's up to your organization to determine what it means to be competent uh, to audit the new standard. Um, there are a variety of resources available uh, for transition training. David Gillen asks, I noted that preventive action was used in our presentation today. I thought it was removed from the standard. Is it still good to create preventive actions? 
David, you're 100% correct. Uh, the phrase preventive action no longer appears in the 9001-2015 standard. However, uh, the idea um, uh, is still very much, uh, uh, it's still a very good approach to showing that you're utilizing risk-based thinking as part of your um, quality system. So uh, is it good to create preventive actions? Absolutely. Uh, as a means of showing that you're utilizing risk-based thinking. Uh, Shoba Ayer, I do hope I'm pronouncing that right. If external and internal issues include suppliers, employees, etc., and interested parties also has same example, then what is the difference between them? Well, the difference is that uh, an issue uh, is going to be like, for example, your your supplier is no longer going to be offering a particular type of raw material. That's an issue. That's an, uh, an uh, external issue. The supplier, in this case, would be the interested party. So it, it, it's, a, it's a nuanced difference, but they're definitely two parts of a, of a very similar idea. Rebecca McKean asks, what are the resources I believe you mean for uh, internal auditor training? Rebecca, we do have a transition course on our website uh, at www.pjr.com. Uh, beyond that, we do not have uh, sanctioned uh, internal auditor transition training. Uh, Shoba Ayer asks, once certified for ISO 9001-2008, is there a gap audit available for 2015? Um, I'm afraid we are not auditing, uh, we're not doing pre-assessments or gap audits. We would, we, as a certification body, we would come in and do your regularly scheduled surveillance audit or recertification audit. Uh, in terms of a gap assessment of that nature, that would be something you would probably have to arrange through a consultant. Uh, Fuat Ramazanov, again, I do hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, it was mentioned that audit bodies audit the organization's stated processes. Is it a good idea to develop a strategic planning process uh, to demonstrate compliance and commitment to the several new requirements mentioned today? What would the process look like? Um, I'm not going to say that it, it would be wrong to have a strategic planning process. Um, if that is the ideal approach for your organization to kind of get your hands around some of these new ideas. Uh, however, I'll stop short of saying that it, it's mandatory or that it would be expected. Uh, you should be able to incorporate uh, evidence of strategic planning, um, evidence of risk-based thinking and, th and things like that into your existing processes. Shoba Ayer asks, I'd like to confirm that internal uh, employees are considered interested parties. Yes, they absolutely are considered interested parties. Jamie Edwards White asks, um, we are having a revision C recertification audit in June. I'm going to presume you mean AS9100 revision C. Uh, how should we go about this transition? Do we get certified to revision C again before the deadline this year? Mr. White, or Ms. White, I, I should say, excuse me. Um, I would request that you reach out to your scheduler uh, with that question. I don't feel comfortable commenting on AS9100 related questions. Okay. Uh, show by year. I want to know examples of statutory and regulatory processes. Um, that's going to depend very much so on your specific case, uh, and it would be for your um, auditors and your internal staff to ascertain. Uh, I will say that um, we've seen uh, uh, requirements like from OSHA be cited, ITAR has been cited, things of this nature. But it's going to vary from case to case. And uh, furthermore, uh, this is going to uh, uh, be captured often uh, in the contractual process between yourselves and your customers. 
Ruby Magduza asks, what's the criteria for finding nonconformances in the audit? Um, very much the same as it's been before. Uh, if you have a violation of the standard, if you have a violation of internal requirements represented by quality manual, procedures, work instructions, etc., all of that is considered grounds for a nonconformance. Dave DeKrob, uh, again, uh, apologies if I'm mis mispronouncing that. If we feel a procedure is no longer pertinent to our processes, are we able to remove it? For example, a purchasing process. Um, yes, uh, Dave, if you feel that a procedure is no longer relevant and you have sufficient controls in place for your purchasing activity, you can absolutely discontinue use of a purchasing procedure. Uh, Shobayir asks, is the internal audit applicable to the department which makes the processes such as quality assurance? Uh, you are required to show that you have performed an internal audit for your entire quality system, uh, inclusive of all processes. Any further questions today? Yuri Cipriano asks, is it all right to suspend the ongoing audit if I feel that the external auditor is not that familiar with requirements and or auditing the revised standard? Um, Yuri, any time that you feel an audit needs to be terminated, that is uh, a very serious decision. Uh, we would definitely not send an auditor to you that was unqualified. Uh, you would need to discuss that with the management at Perry Johnson and with your auditor before taking such a step. Ruby Magduza asks, if there is no procedure in place, how can the auditor verify effectiveness of implementation? Well, uh, Ruby, uh, speaking for myself, I interview uh, people that perform that process, I sample records of that process, and I look for consistency uh, in what I am told. Uh, quite frankly, I don't read procedures uh, all that often as an auditor because I feel that it's it's much better for me to interview the person doing the work and review the records of the work. Any further questions today? Robin Grimo asks, what qualifications do my internal auditors have to have? Uh, Robin, your internal auditors have to fulfill whatever internal criteria you have established. Uh, it is not uh, up to us to specify to you what that means. However, we would be assessing if the internal audit process is effective. Uh, but as to whether they have to go to auditor school or do a period of self-study or what have you, uh, that is for you to determine. Uh, again, we're, uh, the presentation will be available for reviewing shortly after we're finished, and the slides will be available for download. Any further questions? Okay, well, thank you all for your time. Have a great afternoon, and happy holidays.